Thank you, Connells. Start again. Good morning, everybody. Uh, you're very welcome to this morning's event to mark the launch of our uh, dear colleague, Rory O'Connell's uh, new book on law, democracy, and the European Court of Human Rights. Um, my name is Catherine O'Rourke. I'm TJI director. Um, and it is my great pleasure to share today's event. Um, a book launch is, I think, the nearest we get in academia to a wetting the baby's head as an opportunity to welcome um, a new uh, an important contribution to scholarship into the world um, and to celebrate um, both the, the book and the author. Uh, it is, in fact, uh, book launches are absolutely my favorite academic event. So. Um, it's obviously just a particular joy to be able to do this with, with Rory's new book. Um, it is uh, to acknowledge both the um, immense contribution of the scholarship, um, also the generosity of the colleague. Um, I will say that uh, many of us are in awe of Rory having produced a book at the same time as having supported us so um, consistently and constructively and practically uh, through the last number of years in our own research. Um, and, and finally, it's a pleasure to be able to welcome such distinguished speakers uh, to come and discuss the book's contribution. Uh, and indeed, the uh, distinction of our speakers, I think, is a very good and apt reflection of the uh, stat Rory standing within his own scholarly community and his field. Um, I would, of course, like to add my own personal congrats to Rory on the book. Um, it is um, a masterful piece of scholarship in terms of its synthesis of the law, um, its theoretical contribution, um, and indeed its timeliness. Um, these, these themes and topics could not be more important. Um, given the current climate. Uh, we are, of course, by circumstances, forced to be in virtual format. Uh, but uh, I do want to take an opportunity to, I did notice in the registrations that a usually high number of O'Connells uh, registered for this event. So I want to extend a particularly warm welcome to Rory's family. Um, I am I'm so sad that we aren't together in person to be able to mark this, but it is lovely to have you. Um, I am very committed to doing something in person at some point um, in order to mark this occasion. So hopefully we'll get to raise a glass at some point. Um, and uh, very finally, just in terms of logistics. Uh, so I will I will share. I'm going to Rory's going to start by talking a little bit about the book and its and its uh, ambitions and, and contributions. Um, we'll then move to Professor Gunnar Geerty who's Professor of Human Rights Law at the LSE. Uh, we'll then move to Ruth Robio Marin, uh, Professor of Constitutional Law at the University of Sevilla. Um, and then we'll go back to Rory for a response uh, to the reflections of, of Connor and Ruth. Um, at that point, we will have some time um, at the, towards the end of the hour, we'll have some time for questions and answers. And I would encourage you at that point to turn on your camera, turn on your, your speaker, you'll be able to do that. Um, and feel free to come and make a, a verbal contribution. Um, and likewise, we will have a, a chat function running throughout the session. So if you'd rather put it in writing, um, that's fine too. And I'll keep an eye on those, those questions. Okay. So with that, uh, just to reiterate uh, my warm welcome and um, my further congrats to Rory. So Rory, if you want to kick us off. Well, thank you, Catherine. Sound working okay? Yeah, you can hear. Perfect. Good. Uh, so, uh, thank you, uh, Catherine, for that warm introduction and uh, also for reminding me that I did need to move a book launch up my to do list uh, for this academic year. Uh, so I'm very grateful for that uh, and grateful to everyone who's coming along to this talk uh, about my new book. I'm sorry that we cannot offer the traditional food and refreshments that we would normally do for a book launch, uh, but maybe maybe next year we can do something of that sort. Um, the first thing I would just like to say is that I, I've been struck by really the remarkable generosity uh, that many people have shown me uh, in the writing of this book. Um, it would not have been possible to finish the book without a period of sabbatical leave provided by Ulster University. And that sabbatical leave would not have been possible without the uh, willingness of my colleague, Professor Siobhan Wills, uh, to cover my administrative responsibilities uh, for several months. Uh, so I'm very grateful to Ulster and especially Siobhan. And I'm also grateful to head of school, Eugene McNamee and acting head of school, Amanda Sakharopoulou, who both strongly encouraged me to stick on an out of office message at a crucial time in order to get the text over the line. Uh, 
as well as many other people too numerous to mention uh, who've offered support um, and comments, uh, constructive criticism on the text um, along the way. Uh, I'm very fortunate to have worked with outstanding administrative colleagues in the Institute and the school uh, who also supported me both uh, in terms of discharging my administrative responsibilities, but also regularly asking me about the progress of the book. Uh, when one of them started to ask me increasingly in terms of um, some amusement, is that book not done yet? I know it was probably time to send the final email to Cambridge. Uh, and Cambridge, of course, was also very supportive and generous, uh, not least in my numerous requests uh, to delay submission of the book until it was ready, uh, and through the uh, comments provided by anonymous reviewers, uh, which has certainly strengthened the work. Uh, my family were supportive in their own way, and I could not have completed this without the um, unconditional uh, support uh, from my wonderful wife, Fiona, uh, and other members of my family, though some uh, in a different generation still insist they do not know the difference between a sabbatical and a holiday. Uh, and finally, just a special thanks to Catherine and uh, especially Connor and Ruth for agreeing to join us today. So the book itself uh, grew out of a realization that even though the term democratic or similar terms feature significantly in the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, there was very little in English at least uh, examining how this term, a paradigm example of what uh, an essentially contested concept might mean in convention jurisprudence. Uh, apart indeed from uh, some significant work by Conor Geerty himself and a few others, the use of the term had not been unpacked in the literature. So the book examines the political rights jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights to understand the model of democracy that is presupposed, if any, by the convention and the court and consider whether the case law gives any hope for those who might want to push the convention in the direction of a more deliberative, participatory and inclusive model of democracy. Uh, the book has three introductory chapters and different models of democracy, the drafting of the convention, uh, and the principles used to interpret and apply the convention, and then looks at the different political rights, free expression, free assembly and association, the right to vote and to run for election. The structure of the um, of Article 3, Protocol 1 on electoral rights and the nature of the case law also required me to have chapters on the scope of the electoral rights and the regulation of electoral systems, so uh, chapters looking at systemic issues uh, rather than individual rights. In terms of the history and the context of the Convention's treatment and the Court's treatment of these issues, whilst it's a truism that the Convention is mainly concerned with civil and political rights, and much less so economic, social, cultural, and minority rights, there are some oddities about the Court's treatment of political rights. For starters, the most obvious political rights, the rights to vote and to run for election, are not explicitly laid out in the Convention itself. They are found in Protocol 1, uh, and even there, the wording of the article is not about the rights to vote and to run for election, but rather is set out in terms of the state duty to hold elections at regular intervals for the legislature. The inclusion in a separate protocol reflects concern that the electoral rights, like the right to education and the right to property, were controversial. The objective wording of the article was intended to stress the solemn importance of elections, though unsurprisingly gave rise to concerns that individual rights as such were not protected. And this ambivalence about political rights is also reflected in the relatively late emergence of the court's jurisprudence on the electoral rights. Uh, the court only decided a case on electoral rights for the first time in 1987 with the Matthew Nohan judgment involving the Belgian consociational system. Since then, and especially since the 1990s, there has been a dramatic increase in the number of cases involving electoral rights, uh, some very important and high profile ones, the right to vote for prisoners, challenges to threshold requirements, challenges to consociational arrangements, frustration decisions, decisions on the dissolution of political parties. At the same time, there has also been an increase in challenges to the role and authority of the court. Uh, the early 21st century saw much focus on the extraordinary backlogs in the court's workload, regularly over 100,000 cases. 
institutional responses have addressed some of these problems, but meanwhile, other challenges have emerged, ranging from state arguments concerned about the alleged activism of the court to much more serious challenges to the authority of the court and the practice of democracy in Europe. The court's approach to the political rights in the convention contains a dichotomy between a fairly strict approach to protecting individual rights, especially free expression, to a large degree free assembly and association, and to a degree the rights to vote and run for election. But at the same time, the margin of appreciation, uh, which with the 15th protocol will become a part of the text of the convention from August, is frequently invoked when matters are politically sensitive, and especially when the court finds itself confronting matters of electoral design. The result is a case law that broadly supports a liberal model of representative democracy in which individuals can express themselves, form associations, protests, vote and run for office. And there is this commitment to substantive values of tolerance, pluralism and broad mindedness reflected in the court's approach to limitations on violent sectarian uh, and sexist political activity. But the court accords a wide margin of appreciation when moving towards the electoral rights and especially the right to run for election. And this wide margin of appreciation is especially apparent when considering matters of electoral systems more so than individual rights. Uh, the court famously is reluctant to consider issues or to find violations at least about the disproportionality of electoral results in the United Kingdom or Turkey, um, both under very different electoral systems. The liberal representative model that is supported in the convention is itself limited, both in general terms and in the specific terms of the convention. In general terms, a representative liberal model of democracy centers around voting, and this ignores the importance of deliberation as a process for shaping preferences. It risks allowing the influence of money to be excessive. It overlooks democratic fora where some groups can participate who cannot participate through voting, uh, for example, children, uh, non-nationals and others. In relation to the specific terms of the convention, the scope of the electoral rights only applies to elections for the legislature. While the court has included the European Parliament and federal and evolved legislatures in this regard, it has refused to include other acts of political democracy, for example, voting for presidents, voting in local elections, and voting in referendums within the scope of Article 3, Protocol 1. In this regard, the convention and its case law is significantly narrower, for instance, than the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And this is so even though there have been quite um, forceful uh, comments uh, and situations and court cases in the UK and Turkey, which might suggest that it's time to bring referendums within the scope of Article 3, Protocol 1, for instance. So what then of the possibility to promote deliberation, inclusion, inclusion, participation using the Convention's case law? On deliberation, there is some evidence that the court takes into account and to that extent encourages deliberation uh, and not just voting on matters of human rights. This is seen most clearly in the Animal Defenders International case involving the United Kingdom's ban on political advertising. Uh, in Animal Defenders International, the court, by the narrowest of majorities in the Grand Chamber, found the UK ban to comply with Article 10, influenced by the extensive discussion of the balance between free expression and political equality that was deliberated upon both in Parliament and in the UK courts. Of course, Anne Phillips and others caution against a model of deliberation that is simply about discussion and rationality, but overlooks issues of inclusion, equality, participation. On participation, there is some, though admittedly limited perhaps, potential for participatory interpretations of Articles 8, 10, and 11. Uh, for instance, Article 8 has sometimes been interpreted to require some processes of consultation around environmental decisions. The court has sometimes used Article 8 and more recently Article 10 to protect in a limited degree the right to receive information. And the court has made some moves to ensure that the political rights case law is inclusive with strong pronouncements on exclusions of voters and grounds of race and ethnicity and mental health, uh, and at least initially on prisoner rights. It has backtracked somewhat on the rights of prisoners to vote 
allowing considerable leeway in Scopola against Italy after the earlier decision in Hearst against the United Kingdom. But while the court seems to permit gender parity laws, for instance, it has not so far required states to take positive action, uh, to take to respect positive obligations to tackle sex discrimination in electoral systems. There is an unreflective assumption that bans on non-nationals voting are convention compliant, uh, which uh, an article that Ruth and I co-authored many years ago now, uh, we thought even 20 years ago was problematic. And whilst that is consistent with the results in case law and nationals voting from abroad, its acceptance of the ban, the court's acceptance of the ban seems to cut against the reasoning in those cases. And what is striking about all of these is that the court's focus has largely been on the formal limits on political inclusion and less so on the structural and ind indirect limits, uh, which restrict uh, many different groups of people. Uh, from participating effectively and equally in the political system. Uh, so that's the overview of the book. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, back to Catherine and Connor, I think. So thank you, Rory. I'm just going to hand over to Connor. Connor, you've got the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rory. That was excellent. Can I just, I've got 10 minutes, folks, so I'll be fairly brisk, but I will use up some of the time just paying tribute to Rory. I think in some many ways, what you got there was Rory. I mean, the first quarter of his talk was thanking everybody else. And I think we need to acknowledge sometimes that this is his moment. This is his moment. And he is a superb academic. I'm not surprised that where he's, uh, the people lucky enough to have him in the workplace are so grateful and appreciative. And uh, he's able to combine this citizenship with the production of this really, really good book. And if you haven't, I, I read it because I had to, I had to read it in order to decide whether to put something on. And I, I don't do those things routinely. And I was very, very impressed. Why, why? Uh, first of all, I think it's quite rare. I don't know whether Ruth would be talking about this, but it's quite rare to combine a teaching book with scholarship, it's quite rare. Normally, a teaching book you can give to the students and it's got sort of a fairly different approach, which is about learning. Uh, and this has that in spades, but it also has scholarship, which is really great. It's contributing a lot and it's educating. That is hard to pull off. It's made possible by, uh, I just advise you to have a look at the book, a very fluid style, a really relaxed writing style. Now, Rory might tell us that he spends the morning crafting a sentence. Possibly he does, while the family of O'Connells are saying, what's going on? Is this a holiday? Why aren't you out there cleaning the kitchen? You haven't got a proper job, which is the risk all of us academics have when encountering people in normal life. But it may be he writes it very quickly. It may be he writes it very slowly. I don't know, but the result is very easy to read in the best sense, in the best sense. Now, these qualities come together in this book and he was nice enough, typical Rory, to mention me in his talk. But I love the foregrounding of the political. I love it. It's not particularly sexy in the field of human rights. We human rights people love kind of dramatic, life-changing events. At the moment, courts are stepping over themselves to stop climate change, and we're all thrilled. And we love drama. And we're kind of lefties. I think the word social democratic, but we're lefties. So we love social rights and we love standing up for the poor and the downtrodden. And the political hasn't had as big a space in our minds as you would imagine, which is really, it's quite surprising, but it's true. And if you look at the European Convention on Human Rights itself, the structure is kind of against it. You know, Rory's mentioned this in his talk. It sneaks in not even a right to vote. It sneaks in in a kind of protocol-y thing beside property. It sneaks in this thing about maybe we should have kind of vaguely sort of democratic. And it's, it's even qualifying political freedoms as being, uh, the obvious one is, is expression, as being capable of being uh, removed in the interest of a democratic society. It's one of those beautiful paradoxes in the convention. What does that mean? And it also allows us to bash people we think are anti-rights, which is a kind of dodgy thing, Rory talks about in the book. 
it's been unnoticed for ages. It's coming up. It's coming up a bit now. It's kind of scary. And so one of the things this book does in its fluid way, it, it actually foregrounds what we should be talking about when we talk about the European Convention on Human Rights. And so we, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to make three points, but those are made because the book has made them possible. So the book is creating a space for what I think of as really, really important discussion. And the discussion is parasitic on the book. And that's the way you achieve change. You know, you have to fill in forms to show its impact. But that is the way you achieve change. Intellectual change is followed by policy change, is followed by practice. So that's great. I think it's great at doing that. Uh, what are my points? Firstly, is the importance of process. Comes through time and time again in this book. Now, yeah, I was trying to add it up, like lots of human rights people, not very good at maths. 28 years ago, I wrote a, a, an article in the Cambridge Law Journal, which reduced the entirety of the case stuff, the European Court of Human Rights, to process. And at the time, there were only 464 cases in the European Court of Human Rights. You could literally read them all. They were mostly about Italy and mostly about delays in procedures, but there weren't many, in other words. And so I'm really interested in how you characterize the convention case law in procedural terms. And the reason it's really interesting and useful, at least to me, is I think, and Rory tackles this directly, and a lot of people avoid it, is the crucial question of the role of courts and political bodies in the arrangement of our affairs in a political democratic society. The Americans cared about this a lot in the old days. And there's a guy, Ely, who Morley knows of and writes about trying to create frameworks of compromise between these two fora. And one of the ways that's attractive to do this is to foreground procedure. And you say kind of, oh, well, the courts are not imposing their own view. They're sort of, they're sort of facilitating the kind of discussion that a democracy should have. And so Rory picks up that tradition and, and grows it and observes the emergence of this emphasis on, this is my second of my three points, the, the emergence of this question, this issue of this encouragement of deliberation. So the root in is not, is not margin appreciation. The old school thing in the European Court of Human Rights was basically, this is a weird thing to do with pornography, or this is to do with religion, or my goodness, those Greeks are, we are odd on this, so we'll have margin appreciation. They can do what they want. But it's not that. That's a very loose thing students don't really understand. It's subsidiarity linked to a search of the record to see whether the domestic court and the domestic bodies were interested in the convention when they came to address the issue at their level, subsidiarity. And I, I think this is a kind of macro process. It wasn't around 28 years ago, and it's very much around now. So it's deliberation. So we are asking ourselves as a European Court of Human Rights, not necessarily is A, a breach of the convention. We're asking ourselves as a route to answering that question, how seriously did the country that's in issue here take the convention? And I mentioned the big case of animal rights defenders and so on. Uh, they take a lead from countries. So they're beginning to form a view of the integrity of the country's process in considering convention rights. That is a neat way of foregrounding democracy in the management of the idea of rights. But there is an interesting catch. And the catch, in my opinion, is the assumption that if people in a legislature or in a court take into account the convention, they're bound to follow it. So deliberation implies an open-ended outcome. And all we want is deliberation. But actually, we're not really like that in the convention. We want deliberation to produce the answer that we approve of. So is a process, or my final point, is it, in my final point coming, is it going to be substance? That's really interesting. That's really interesting. What happens, and, and Rory's book touches on all of this, but I think it's going to be the game going forward. What happens if a country does 
accept the invitation from the European Court of Human Rights or in litigation in anticipation of that case uh, to reconsider very, very carefully whether what they have at the moment is a breach of the convention. And they say, well, actually, we rather like it. It's great. We love breaching the convention. And so you have had detailed deliberation, which produces the wrong result. We have a hint of that in the case of Hearst, the horrible axe killing guy. I mean, he might have been sent in by the Brexit people to destroy the integrity of the European process. I don't know if anybody has seen him in action, John Hurst. But you see that in that case. So, so, so for a while, it's kind of all the British need to do is think seriously about whether to give prisoners a vote. And then the British think seriously about whether to give prisoners a vote and say they'd rather like to not give them a vote. And then the European Quarter, through the Committee of Ministers, slightly with the tail between its legs, agrees or seems to be agreeing a kind of fairly minimalist interpretation of the compliance. That's a problem going forward. Deliberation, does it determine outcomes? Relatedly, in the uh, British context, we have this kerfuffle over the Human Rights Act, and it's replicated in other, other countries, actually, certainly in Russia. I don't know the whole range of stuff. Uh, where, what does a domestic court do about not just the convention, but about the case law from Strasbourg on what the convention means? And there, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm winding down. Uh, Catherine, I know I'm, I'm overusing my, my time here a little bit. Just There, the British say, have regard to, but you don't have to follow the convention case law. And initially, Lord Bingham and his friends in the Supreme Court and the House of Lords Court said, you have to follow, be sensible. Now they don't, now they don't. So what does it mean to have regard to and reject? And so there's cases coming through in Strasbourg, Juan Castle was one actually, where the court is confronted by a very clever sort of Supreme Court decision, which is explaining why they're wrong. What did they do? So, so we have one or two very offensive remarks by some of the judges about how useless Strasbourg is. So it'll be interesting to see what Strasbourg does, the challenge, what Strasbourg does when the a deliberation includes analysis of their case law and rejection and rejection. Final point of my three, uh, Rory touched on it, really, how much does process become substance? So we all like certain outcomes because we're those kinds of people. We like equality, we like inclusion, to, par uh, to mention two that he draws on in his book, borrowing from my colleague at LSE, Ann Phillips. So, so do, we, do we say that unequal outcomes are breaches of process? Do we say that lack of inclusion is a breach of process? How far do we push process to become the world that we want? So we have a kind of covert modeling of the world under cover of process. Uh, I'd be interested in in what Rory say, if anything, on that in his reply, and I'll now make way via Catherine, I suspect, to Ruth. But congratulations, Rory, on a considerable achievement. Thank you so much, Connor. That was so rich. Um, and I'll hand over to Ruth. Um, well, like uh, Connor, I want to start by congratulating Rory. I think. Um, uh, I mean, having having lived almost in parallel uh, to Rory, the, the painful process of writing a book uh, again, um, I have to say that uh, it is it is just really, really a tour de force to be able to put. We live in really strained uh, lives, and uh, the uh, demands on academic life, you know, from marking to PhD supervision, to teaching, to reviewing, to evaluating. It, it is just so much intention with the kind of abstraction, sustained work, not to mention work-life balance or child rearing, because then, you know, I could just use my 10 minutes on that. So I think that, the, you know, to be able to do this, I and mean, we are in the time in which even articles are not being, it's now blogs. So uh, this is a bravo Rory, and this is a plea for us to, to continue living up to the demands, the intellectual demands that doing this kind of work, and we know it deeply in our hearts takes, and, and Rory has done in a, a wonderful job at, at doing that. I was, I was very moved um, by, by two things. Um, Two moments. I have known Rory 
since we were studying together our PhDs at the European University Institute in Florence, 24 years, my dear Rory. And I still remember probably your greatest, um, one of your greatest contributions to my intellectual uh, upbringing was when um, in view of my total ignorance, you agreed to teach me uh, political theory 101. And so uh, over lunch, after lunch, we would sit in the garden, we would use Will Kimlicker's introduction to political theory, and he would teach me what communitarianism meant and what liberalism really meant. And, um, and, and it's just so moving to be reading this book now, because of course we both, uh, you had it in you, you, had, you came with it. I, was, I hadn't been exposed to it in my undergraduate, but you, had, you have stuck to this. And so have I, this combination of political theory and, 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 and political science lenses to make sense of the law. And I think this is really, really so useful because otherwise we lose so much time. And you know, I always say, how many books can we write about proportionality or the margin of appreciation just per se? You know, I mean, what is interesting is to link that as, as Connor just did to the big questions. You know, what is the role, the systemic roles that these legal doctrines are playing? And that is very hard to do if you don't have some kind of theoretical frame to organize this. So I think that the first one who should thank you for this book is the court itself. I think that if the judges read your book, they will uh, become much more aware of what they're actually doing or contributing to do or to undo than they are. You know, they don't have time, you know, to, to read these theories, but they are actually, whether aware or not, contributing to different understandings of democracy. And, it, and I agree with what Connor said. I mean, you know, it's a human rights court. They don't naturally take themselves to be uh, playing a role about deciding what democracy should be beyond a minimum, bare minimum core, and even that. Um, they probably think it is for, for member states to decide within a, a large range of options what model of democracy they wanna have. But whether, but reflectively or unreflectively, with their case law, I think this book shows that neutrality is not an option. Whether you are reflective or not is a different question, but you are contributing to different forms of understanding democracies and, and its boundaries. So I think that um, you know, the court can gain a much uh, deeper self-reflection about what it is doing over time whether its understanding of democracy is keeping in pace with the challenges of the time, whether it is being consistent or not in the kind of normative vision that it is for grounding. And one point that you repeatedly uh, uh, make in the book that I couldn't agree more with is whether in those cases in which it is not consistent, and there are many, uh, there is bias in what kind of bias uh, and, and what that is expressive of, you know, are we more leaning towards certain forms of uh, democratic understandings when Turkey is at stake as opposed to other countries, right? So I think that all of that is, is, is key and, and, and your book has such a, um, a you know, comprehensive and well-organized scheme that I think it will help, um, um, it will help the court and the readers make sense of the ways in which certain visions of democracy are being foregrounded or not. The second moment you mentioned, Rory, and it was our writing together of the European Convention and the Relative Rights of Resident Aliens. So basically suffrage or lack of suffrage for non-citizens. And it's so actually it's, it's moving that you have, that was closer to my topic of dissertation at the time, but you have, you have picked on it and, and, and can continued working on it. And this is obviously one of the topics the book continues to cover, but it covers many more, uh, which I think is, are extremely timely. You know, this, this moment in which the tenets of the rule of law and democracy within Europe, um, you know, is being discussed. Uh, what a timely book. So I know this has taken you years. So I wanna ask you, how did you know, Rory? 
that you would be sending this <laughs> right at the very uh, uh, right moment? Did you make it on purpose to delay it until the time was unfortunately really uh, uh, <laughs> right? Um, secondly, I want to say before, you know, besides sharing uh, my, my, my emotions around this, that I am very um, I'm very impressed by the, in, not only by the interdisciplinarity, which I touched upon, by the analytical legal rigor and by the subtle normativity. I have never learned to be subtle, but you are so subtle. <laughs> you know, so you, 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 you as, as Connor was saying, you know, human rights, like big of, you know, dramatic cases, big cases, but you are like how to support more deliberative, participatory, and inclusive democratic practices, which is your normative uh, desire. But how to do it not just in general by trashing one decision, you know, pick the worst decision and just, you know, but actually by, you know, um, looking at ways in which you can ground, uh, first of all, make, a, make the court aware of the ways in which it is already doing that. So if you have done it once or twice, just become aware and continue doing it. And secondly, what are some of the subtle ways that you haven't picked up, but that you could consider in your own doctrine in other domains, right? So you don't really need to make this all up. You, you just have to actually replicate certain things or replicate, for instance, you know, your position on positive obligations that you have developed around other a case law, just bring it here. So I, I really admire that way, the way that you have to be normative. That is, you know, you just don't take, you don't just lay out the theories, pick your favorite and then just trash every case law that doesn't live up to it. You state it and you make the court aware of what it's already doing. And then you point to ways in which it could be further doing but that are grounded on what the court has done uh, in the past. So bravo, bravo. I think the only, the only, uh, and I don't know because whether it's proper, but you know, Rory and I have to be debating endlessly. This is, this is what he taught me to do over lunch and I, will, I have learned my lesson. So the only thing I, I, I would say, Rory, is that, and, and you probably had reasons for not doing this, but when you go to theories of democracy, I think I, 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 I want to ask you, and I know equality is there, and, and I know you're, you're concerned about structural issues, right? And the equality comes in different, because it's, it touches upon so many things, right? It touches upon participation, it touches upon deliberation, inclusion, even within your substantive democracy, you then have uh, one strand, which is perfectionist liberalism, and the other one that is more communitarianism. See, I learned my lesson. And then within the, and then within the perfectionist liberalism, you have the uh, militant democracy, so kind of general interest on the one hand, and then equality concerns of minority. So it's in many places. But I would have want to ask you, why did you not foreground it more clearly and say, well, you know, parity democracy? or multicultural democracy, right? The court, the convention was done in the 50s. And I think especially after the 90s, we see this participatory, you know, eclosion that yes, you know, is reflected in some of the participatory literature that you describe, but I think it has been further pushed in more structural terms by people who've said, well, there's, there's, it's not just that our mainstream institutions aren't being inclusive enough of minorities. So let me just focus for a couple of minutes. I think I have still have two minutes uh, on, on, on the parity democracy. I have been writing, and you know this, that I do think you know, that there is a new understanding of democracy and democratic legitimacy that is being pushed uh, if you take Council of Europe, if you take European Union, it's gender balance participation uh, as a threshold. So it's the very European institutions. If you take the wave of quotas that have, you know, invaded Europe, uh, uh, the domain spread from the legislature to other domains of governance, but also more interestingly, some of the constitutional 
uh, evolutions. So for instance, the fact that both in, German, in, in France and in Italy, constitutional courts struck down gender balance quotas because they said they are against the current model of democracy, which is general representation, right? And not even substantive equality clauses could save it because the court thought what is being challenged is the very understanding of democracy, which then of course then triggered constitutional amendments. So a whole wave of constitutional amendments to make sure that this new model or understanding of democracy is, 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 is acceptable and defines new standards. I think, you know, you know, I think I would, uh, you know, we could actually say that competing visions of democracy, especially in Europe, uh, with parity democracy, I think having to do with many of the things you mentioned, the inclusion of difference, the, you know, the increased deliberation, but also the disestablishment of gender roles and the, and the overcoming of the separate spheres tradition on which our democratic, liberal democratic models were built. So I think, you know, now, of course, and there's, by the way, one, one case that, uh, one, one extra case, it concerns actually the parity law in Spain, Mendez Pérez et autres against Spain, um, 2011, inadmissible, declaring uh, quota legislation uh, adopted in Spain, not contrary to the convention. So I don't think you would ex necessarily expect I, I, love, I love the idea of why don't you use positive obligations to go down that path? And I think CEDAW committee has done that in the case of women's representation. The court hasn't gone there yet, but I do think that um, you know, flagging more clearly the way, at least it hasn't prevented this from happening. If you flag at the same time that this is a new understanding of democracy that the court could have, could have because other constitutional courts have, and we don't know, Germany, we don't know, the German Bundesverfassungsgericht will soon decide on this. But I think the fact that it hasn't stopped it has uh, to be applauded with uh, more if, and you can do that more if one understands that a new, a new understanding of, of democratic legitimacy is actually being, being crafted in the making in Europe. And I think this may be particularly interesting in view of the gender equality backlash that we are observing across the world, but also within Europe, pressed by some European member states that has again, this idea of recovering the separate spheres traditions, the traditional family and traditional gender roles. So I think we are going to, we're seeing a very interesting conversation, uh, a, a gender war, uh, if one wants, but I think democracy and the understanding of democracy is at the core of it and not just gender equality. And I could, I would, I think I would make the same point, but I'm not going to develop it around multicultural democracy, you know, with a European framework convention on minority rights. I think, you know, it could be, it could be presented as a new understanding of democracy that has been pushed and advanced and normatively endorsed by some since the 90s, of course, with criticism and regression and all the rest. But I think it does offer an, a, a new conception of democracy that goes beyond that what you cover in terms of difference and inclusion and participation, it touches more, you know, to the structural problems and uh, of uh, our, you know, the way in which, you know, you know multinational states are uh, vehiculated through one single demos and, uh, and, 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 and so have a better understanding of the way the court has positioned itself vis-a-vis -vis those understandings of democracy. I think it would have, it would have probably, uh, it could allow to, you know, finger point the inconsistencies, you know, what kinds of multiculturalisms, we, which you do, which you do, you simply don't, you know, pack it. So it's a question of packaging, I think, but, but basically, you know, it, it captures all your, you know, all your intuitions there. It just, it just presents, would, would present that as, you know, alternative models of understanding democracy that are being have been normatively endorsed and also legally uh, endorsed and how does the European Court of Human Rights position in, itself vis-a-vis -vis those taking into account that when the convention was drafted neither multicultural citizenship nor parity democracy were, were, were 
you know, in the environment. But this is just me, you know, wanting us, maybe we should write something together again, Rory. But I really want to uh, end this by saying bravo, uh, you know, what a tour de force, and I will be using it because I do agree with Connor that it's an excellent, it's an excellent book to, to teach and be learning from you while one is teaching, so bravo. Wonderful, thank you so much. Ruth, um, I don't want to interrupt the flow here, so Rory, please go ahead, take the floor. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks uh, really so much, Connor and Ruth, uh, for those um, extremely generous comments and extremely thoughtful comments. Uh, and um, yes, and also pushing on some of the ideas uh, as well. So uh, I, there is a lot in both um, interventions from Connor and Ruth. So uh, apologies, I'll try to run through fairly briskly some of them. Maybe just to pick up on that point on the book being useful for teaching and scholarship. Um, I, I mean, I'm very pleased that you both find that. And um, partly it goes back to one of the struggles I had with writing and designing and thinking about how to put the book together. Um, I, I was reminded a bit of Howard Becker's writing for social scientists. He talks about how one of the big problems is trying to uh, figure out what is the right starting point and coming up with the perfect structure. And of course, there's no such thing as a perfect structure. Uh, uh, which I belatedly realized. Uh, so I had thought of different structures, um, such as one that went through the different, that was focused more about the different models of democracy and have chapters devoted to those, are looking at the problems facing contemporary democracies in Europe in the 21st century and looking at those. Um, and I, for different reasons, I thought those wouldn't produce a satisfactory book um, because uh, the convention is so based in the tradition, uh, the ideals, um, real or imagined of liberal representative democracy, that the first approach would have been unbalanced. And the second one that seemed to me would have simply tried to replicate what other people were doing uh, already and much better. Uh, so it was more this reconstruction uh, with an effort to be critical of the court's approach uh, that I ended up with, and if it enables it to be used for teaching purposes as well as scholarship, um, that is uh, very pleasing to me because I value both the teaching and the research missions of the university, as do we all. On Connor's very perceptive points about substance and process, and particularly the challenge about what happens when uh, we go through the process and we come to the wrong conclusion. Uh, he puts it rather provocatively. And I think this is a really important one. And it's an especially important one also because it's bound up in some of the discussions uh, around um, what people call populism quite often, or a liberal democracy. Uh, but I think Kim Lane Shepela characterizes this as autocratic legalism, uh, which is a very important point because Shepler's argument is that what we are seeing are people, often with clever lawyers, who really push the boundaries of what is legally permitted uh, and do it in ways that end up undermining uh, political and legal accountability and equality. Um, and that is, of course, is a particular risk for this sort of process approach because those clever lawyers could, and we've seen this uh, from Hungary to indeed the United Kingdom, um, come up with quite clever ways of limiting accountability and limiting rights. I suppose the two things that stand out is um, one, it means we need to pay quite close attention to processes of deliberation and who is deliberating and under what conditions they are deliberating. Um, there's sometimes maybe a tendency to think that because a decision has been made by national authority that that has been done under uh, conditions that respect equality in the democratic and deliberative process and that's not necessarily the case. Um, 
there's a big difference between a decision approved by parliament and debated in the courts and one that's effectively decided by the executive. Uh, so one is issues of uh, deliberation. And the other is, and I try to hint at this also in the conclusion, is that I'm not saying that we should go down the route of process and not substance. There's still substance in the convention. Uh, where the process comes in, it seems to me, is where we're pushing the boundaries of the convention. Right? So things like environmental issues under the right to privacy, for instance, seems to be going beyond um, the right to a private life seems to be going beyond the core of the right to privacy, and maybe it's in those sorts of areas where we really need deliberation. Uh, and specifically, for instance, on Hearst, we've had extensive deliberation and debate now in the United Kingdom uh, to res arrive at a position um, 15 years after the Hearst judgment with basically tokenistic implementation of the Hearst judgment, it seems to me. And so uh, when I suggest that Hearst is a case that is different from, say, Animal Defenders International, in that we're dealing with a pretty core removal of the right to vote, uh, one that limits equality and inclusion, uh, and therefore I think the court would be right to be more skeptical of it, even though there has been extensive deliberation. And so I think it's on those two issues, one, the process of deliberation, uh, two, are we going beyond core into more penumbral areas of convention rights um, that we would have to think about in terms of balancing process and substance. Um, uh, quickly, some of Ruth's comments. Um, I suppose I'll, maybe I'll jump to the most important and the most critical uh, of them. Uh, Anyone I think who finishes a writing project is almost immediately beset with regrets and things that they spot as mistakes. Um, I spent most of this week counting up the different typos in the conclusion that uh, Cambridge has kindly provided in open access, uh, including two footnotes that bizarrely I somehow transposed. Uh, so, the, But apart from that, uh, I think my biggest uh, regret or thing I would do differently is uh, devote more attention to the theoretical point of it um, and address more some of those concerns, especially around uh, the gender and parity democracy issues um, that Ruth highlights there. Uh, and yes, I think equality. Um, my next idea for a book is to go back to look at equality in the European Convention. In fact, so maybe I'll try to do a better job of addressing those concerns, Ruth, in that. Um, but I think it's also, uh, so I, I think that's all right in what Ruth is saying, I, but it's also right that partly it goes back to my approach, which is about trying to, and Ruth puts it extremely well and probably better than I do, you know, about shaping the court's jurisprudence in a way without just trashing it or proposing something that would never be taken up by judges. Um, but that necessarily limits also the uh, creativity uh, of the approach. So there are limits also with that. Uh, and at the end of the day, the court remains quite a conservative institution. Uh, the convention remains quite conservative. Uh, so there are uh, some uh, limitations on what you can do with the sort of approach that I've taken in this book, um, which is not to say that it's the best or the only approach far from it. Uh, and I think we are, uh, you know, uh, Ruth um, in her talk recently uh, about gender constitutionalism talks about an evolution from inclusion to participation to transformation. Uh, and I think with the court, we're sort of stuck somewhere between inclusion and participation uh, in terms of what we can do. So but that's just to answer uh, somewhat briefly some of the more important points in those uh, interventions. And thank you very much. Um, back to you, Catherine. I, I know we're running behind time. 
Yes, we're, we are running tight on time. And as, as I anticipated, there's just too much fruit for discussion here and too many interesting people talking about it. Um, nevertheless, we did start five minutes late, so I'm going to make a chair's decision here to give us another five minutes. Um, just first to say a question, a very interesting question has come in. So what I might do is share the question and then give everyone a, an opportunity to give some final thoughts and then, and then we'll wrap. Okay, great. Um, so from Ed Bates, uh, it sounds a fantastic book, Rory, well done. Um, I'm looking forward to reading it. My question or perhaps comment? But for the court, it is not a constitutional court for Europe. Rather, it is a limited international human rights instrument for 47 quite diverse states setting minimum standards. Perhaps this reflects on its legitimacy, stroke what it can legitimately do because it does not have constitutional legitimacy like a national Supreme Court. So if the court is to be more progressive, how does it break out of this legitimacy dilemma uh, i.e. the threat from states being a pushback along the lines of you're not entitled to do this and for which they could even be correct. Um, so I think I'll invite perhaps R R uh, Ruth and, and Connor to uh, to speak first and, and then just leave the last word with Rory. Okay. Do you want, do you want me to go first, Ruth? Uh, well, of course, Ed, Ed uh, Bates, for those of you who don't know, knows what he's talking about. So we have to agree. I would add, Ed, competition between courts. Uh, I'll take an example, blacklisting from the United Nations, where the sanction stuff is going on. And the European Court of Human Rights is kind of a bit coy and a bit anxious. And it's sort of keen not to get in too much of a fight. But then the European Court of Justice and the famous Cardi case and others says, oh, you know, we're a European court. We can do this. And then the European Court of Human Rights thinks, Craig, that's our, that's our area. What's that other court doing? It? and get stuck in, in other cases. So what's my point? The ECJ has more of the personality of a constitutional court than the ECHR. And so it's able to say, we're pitching here for a space marked fundamental rights, and we don't care if it's the United Nations. And that emboldens the European Court of Human Rights, which doesn't want to get left behind to compete in inverted commas. So my answer, Ed, is benign competition between these two courts might, as it were, drive up human rights standards and render the European Court of Human Rights more terrified of irrelevance than of national defiance. Okay, Ruth, um, if you'd like to respond to the question, but also to, to Rory's comments. I don't, I don't really want to respond. I think the, the, I don't think I have anything important to add to the question. Um, to Rory's comments, um, I'm just surprised you're already thinking of your next book. <laughs> I thought your, your feeling would be like, I'm not writing a book again. But no, you know, you are right thinking about the next uh, book. Um, you know, Rory, everyone, everyone struggles with this. And also because your ideas evolve, but also because this takes time. So when you decide the structure, then evolutions happen. So I think this is perfectly, I mean, what I, what I, I guess my, 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 my feeling is that however modest the European court has, has been in not blocking certain evolutions, if we are in backlash times, it may be that uh, for grounding those and holding on to those is the best we can do for a while um, because, because of what the question we got, you know, because if, if those are the times we're living and at the same time the court wants to be very bold, then its legitimacy gets called into question. And I'm thinking here about the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, which has even a more, um, you know, active, role in the system and is now currently facing, you know, national sovereignty claims, uh, questioning its legitimacy. So I guess there has to be just a, a sense of political opportunity. I'm going to call it like that because I do think that it is what it is between, you know, how far can I go without undermining my own legitimacy? And that has to be in dialogue with the times. So it's a very a challenging uh, thing to do. So I don't think, you know, one could do significantly better than you have done. It, it is just a very thin line to walk. 
and, and, and being very advocacy like, it's great, you do this when, when you're very young, but we're not there anymore quite. So <laughs> we are more modest <laughs> about uh, what we can do as scholars. And I think this is exactly the right approach, Rory, to show, to make, to give that distance. You know, this is the time that judges don't have to step back and look systematically by putting the pieces together in what it is that it comes when you do that and when you have certain uh, grids of analysis to think through. So this is, I think, yeah, the, the tremendous achievement that you have done and I wouldn't really change and don't worry about a couple of footnotes. I mean, <laughs> this is, I know perfection is, 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 is such a nice thought, but by now we have given up on that too. <laughs> bravo, Rory, bravo. Thanks, Ruth, and thanks, Conor, again. Um, uh, Ruth said she wasn't going to try to answer Ed's, Ed's question, but actually did. Uh, I think um, he's point to uh, the answer, uh, and uh, it's uh, and it, of course, um, as Conor says, Ed Bates certainly knows what he's talking about. Uh, and this is a huge problem. Um, um, you know, we're reminded of it almost daily, I think, even this week, for instance, we saw pushback, or last week, we saw pushback from Poland about the authority of the court uh, and, you know, picking up on the types of things that Connor was talking about earlier in relation to how some UK judges criticize um, the court as well. Uh, so it, it, all of these are very challenging. Um, I think courts and judges do need to be aware of uh, the law, issues about legitimacy, but also those wider contexts. And the, and the Court of Human Rights clearly is, if you look at the evolution from Hearst via a slightly more radical judgment against Austria, I think, to then the Scopola ruling, uh, when it gave quite a bit more leeway uh, to national authorities like the United Kingdom. Uh, so, um, you know, institutionally, the court seems to be very much aware of that issue. Uh, I suppose one of the worries, well, I suppose two things. One is, um, you know, just how much leeway can the court give and still be credible? Um, I think Scopola gives leeway, uh, but if it's accepted that what the UK has done in response to Hearst, for instance, uh, is acceptable, then it'd be provocatively be more consistent just to say Hearst was wrong uh, because the response has been so limited. And then you get back to uh, what's the point of the court. Um, uh, but the other issue is, of course, that, uh, you know, we, again, Ruth reminds me that when we were much younger, uh, you know, maybe some of us had ideas about what courts could and could not do. Um, but uh, Conor Geerty's writings also remind us that there are limits to judges and what courts can do. Uh, and so the European Court of Human Rights plays an important role in the protection of rights, democracy, and the rule of law in Europe. Uh, but it can't be our last and only hope either. Uh, so that's why uh, we were discussing this in the pre-meeting, you know, uh, interventions um, uh, as from Ruta in, in the Netherlands over Hungary uh, over the last few days are also uh, very important uh, in terms of maintaining standards of democracy, human rights and rule of law in Europe. I think that's a fitting note on which to conclude the discussion. Um, this has been just really a, a wonderful, um, I think the richness of the discussion is indeed a reflection of the richness of the book. Um, so I'll conclude really just um, on a, one logistical note, which is uh, we will, we've recorded the event. So we'll send out the recording to anyone who's registered. Um, and more meaningfully, just to conclude again, uh, firstly, with thanks to Connor and to Ruth for your generous contributions and your ge generous acknowledgements of Rory's work. Um, and a final, I think, bravo to Ria and a bravo to Rory um, on a wonderful piece of scholarship. So, okay, we'll say bye-bye, take care, and uh, hopefully we'll see you all again in, in person. All right, take care.